Here is one of our most significant participants, and she's going to present our, our presenter for today. Um, She's a native of Chicago, Illinois, and serves as General Secretary for the Samuel DeLitt Proctor Conference, which represents a cross-section of progressive African-American faith leaders and the congregations across the United States, addressing critical needs of human and social justice within local, national, and global communities. She's a renowned social justice and policy advocate and educator. She has served on the faculty of Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago and has founded Nexus Unlimited, which is an information and educational technology firm and served as the company's president. She is the author of The Church and Reparations, an African-American Perspective, and has received her master's in theological studies from Garrett Evangel uh, me, Evangelical Theological Seminary in Chicago and her PhD in psychology and her MA in Counseling Education from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. So everyone, please give a beautiful round of applause. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you can uh, hear my voice. I am struggling a little bit with a sore throat. But to God be the glory, first and foremost. I could not stand here and have experienced what I have once again experienced in this historic sacred space and not begin with a moment of silence as a way for us to pour libation, to affirm and invoke the ancestral spirits, the sacrifices that they made so that we might be here. So I would just ask all of us to reflect on those who have gone before and know that those who are in the wombs of our children and yet to be born are listening and watching and waiting. Forgive us, O oh Lord, and we ask that the spirit of Papa Dallas, who was one of the last slaves to be interviewed as a part of the WPA project, who said, don't weep for me, my daughter. Just remember to tell my story. Mm -hmm. right. And so that's what we're engaged in, telling the story. I am always delighted to come home to Tuskegee. And I say home in a way not like most of you know this to be home. I'm not raised in here or born here, but I was conceived here. I was conceived on this very campus and in 1942 my parents married in the chapel, okay? My father was a Tuskegee Airman down here and so I claim this sacred space and I feel the power of Tuskegee. And so I'm always delighted to be home. And then Dr. Rubin, it is just such a wonderful uh, testimony to your vision and your tenacity to make come true a dream that we have had, which is to have this kind of conversation on this sacred ground. And so I am truly, truly um, pleased to be here to um, stay in reflection around this quad centennial period from 1619 uh, to 2019 and to think about the bookends of reparations and reconciliation. What I do know is that you can't have either unless you begin with the truth. And so what I um, struggled with and came up with as I was asked to speak to the post-traumatic slave syndrome um, was, uh, and, and I'm not a psych, well, kind of, I do have a degree in psychology, I just remembered, but I am associated. <laughs> um, and, um, 
And I, I just love so much the, the power of, of Dr. Joy's work. And so you've read the book, or you know of the book and her work. And so it, it was easy for me to, uh, to take on this assignment, but I had to uniquely figure out what it was I wanted to do. And so I decided that um, what I would talk about is the post-traumatic slave syndrome as a sacred calling in the age of Afrophobia and epigenetics. And in that way, um, hope to um, provide some, some insights and some, some ways for us to think a little differently about where we go from here. Um, <clears throat> in the 1970s, I, I, I wrote a piece around neo-eugenics looking at the impact of the Human Genome Project on um, the possibilities for Du Bois' notion that we um, are confronting um, a color line, a color line that in his vision, in his world, was defined in terms of phenotypic terms. That is, how do you look? Mm -hmm. But the Human Genome Project was taking this to a whole nother level. It was raising the color line in respect to the genome or the genotypic knowledge that was being created, which raised a whole nother level of, of ethical, bioethical, and uh, theoethical issues for uh, what it means to be human. And I was looking at that in relationship to how we must uh, begin to think a little differently and more strategically about what was on the cusp. And so as uh, uh, Dr. Paris talked about telling your story and who you are as a part of it, I want to give you a disclaimer. I am not an objective scientific uh, researcher. I come to this with subjectivity. I come to this as a woman with an African lens, as a lens of a faith person, and as one who comes out of African tradition. And so I'm unapologetic about that. And as my grandmother said, whatever you do, darling, you get the PhD, don't forget your common sense, okay? So um, let's go on. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me. So in the 1990s, um, it was clear that uh, what had uh, not been actualized in the civil rights movement was, in fact, um, turning more into a nightmare than Martin Luther King's dream. And that was being ushered in by the declaration of President uh, Nixon uh, and the war on drugs. And this kind of methodology um, and the context of this and the paradigms of how we got to uh, understand what it is we know um, was being articulated in terms of an African-centered movement or African-centric uh, research. Um, that research um, was taking root in terms of intellectual and academic um, praxis. I would name myself, in fact, a scholar vist, meaning a scholar activist, that I claim that you could not do effective scholarship if you were not in the community and engaged in an action. Um, so this movement was done uh, really in a pan-African global context. And by definition, it was plural disciplinary. In other words, part of deconstructing African, um, part of deconstruction Western knowledge and ways of knowing was to say that the separation of all these disciplines would never lead us where we need to go. We have to figure out how to reconstruct these different disciplines, whether you're talking about medicine or psychology or sociology or anthropology or physics, you had to come at it from a plural disciplinary point of view. And one of the most significant scholars to share that was, in fact, uh, Sheikh Anta Diop. Sheikh Anta Diop was a, a, a Senegalese scholar who um, was a person who wrote three dissertations before the Sorbonne in, French, in France would accept his dissertation. And he was uh, one of the most significant researchers who uh, in fact, declared and proved that Egypt was an African civilization. So long before the uh, Suez Canal, um, we must understand that the biblical story takes place in an African complex and an African culture. Um, I was privileged to study with Sheikh Hamza and take my students to study with Sheikh Hamza Diab. And that becomes important as you begin to, to hear me um, speak about 
um, my experiences, but Che Diop was uh, uh, my mentor. My other mentor was John Henry Clark, who I think someone has also mentioned. And John Henry Clark was the Harlem historian um, who, in his last, uh, one of his last words to me, um, I turned out to be his daughter and was the executor of his estate. Um, but his, one of his last uh, pronouncements to me was, daughter, um, your generation is going to have to address the fact that whites are going to uh, declare uh, black people to be the progenitors of the slave trade. And so you all are going to have to defend um, that you, in fact, were not the founders and the progenitors and the reason the slave trade took hold. And so if I had to subtext my remarks, it would kind of be very simply, know thyself, heal thyself, and stay woke. Um, in 2001, um, I was a delegate to the Durban Conference in South Africa on uh, racism. And um, I think most of you will know that the United States refused to support that conference. They did everything they could to block a notion of even uh, a, a declaration that slavery was a crime against humanity. Because to have done that would have set the stage for reparations. And as a result of that, there still is no definitive statement of the United States acknowledging that slavery was a crime against humanity. All of this I share because all of this came before Joy DeGreer's work. And none of us do this work as individuals. We do it collectively and on the backs and on a continuum of those who have gone before. And Joy was one in the field of psychology who was preceded by the work of Naeem Akbar and Wade Nobles and Asa Hilliard. Um, psychiatrist Patricia Newton, as well as psychiatrist Francis Cress Wilson and Francis Cress Wilson's um, Francis Cross Wellsing's mentor, um, uh, Mr. Neely. And I say all that because when her um, theory came in of the post-traumatic uh, slave syndrome, we have to admit that it did make a paradigm shift. And it was a significant work. And Dr. Joy said, quote, I wanted to know what it was about the word slavery that makes people so combative. You can't fix what you don't understand, so you have to understand in order to know where you can heal. She was using, um, as a part of her context and backdrop, the fact that um, finally a post-traumatic um, stress syndrome had become a legitimate category um, in the medical profession. And so it was with that uh, backdrop then that she said that post-traumatic slave syndrome is a condition that exists when a population has experienced multi-generational trauma resulting from centuries of slavery and continues to experience impression and institutionalized racism today. Added to this condition is a belief, whether it is real or imagined, that the benefits of the society in which they live are not accessible to them. This then is post-traumatic uh, slave syndrome. It has, uh, what she focused on were um, three categories of vacant esteem, ever a present, uh, the anger, and racist socialization. Now I put up that first screen because that screen kind of reduces uh, what the contribution of Sheikh Abdul Diop was and Theopaul Benga. Um, to our understanding of African-centric uh, history and methodology as well as to our understanding of a world before the slave trade. I am uh, very concerned about our insistent, um, consistent way in which we subconsciously and consciously default to European Western Greek um, theorists often at the expense of forgetting that we gave it to the Roman Greek civilization. So if we want to look at the original wisdom, we need to think about the work of Tahotep, and we need to think about Ma'at. Um, but indeed, that world was interrupted by the Ma'afa, or in Kiswahili, the great suffering, meaning the transatlantic slave trade. And these are just some images of the trade, um, including um, the, the emblem of the boat, <laughs> Jesus, 
which brought us over, um, some of the horrific ways in which we were treated, and then the two statues in the center are those which are done um, at the Montgomery on the grounds of uh, the Lynching Museum. Um, but DeGree's uh, theory uh, and thesis was that she could take the post-traumatic um, um, stress syndrome and translate that in terms of the post-traumatic uh, slave syndrome um, and um, finally, in terms of, uh, she received a lot of criticism, but finally the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders version four revised um, it to at least accommodate what she had identified as the characteristics of what a stress syndrome would be. And it has those things that we know that we have already talked about, the ways in which we experience daily um, the assaults against our social, psycho, emotional, physical uh, selves. A serious threat to harm to our physical uh, being and, and, and integrity, to our children, to our family, seeing and witnessing the killing and the injuring of others, all of that causing a sense of helplessness and stress. Additionally, um, since her work, we also know that the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has pronounced uh, community violence. There's a syndrome and characteristics of community violence which also triggers trauma. And the United Depart US Department of Veteran Affairs has been grappling with this notion of moral injury. And that research also affirms uh, her work in that it too talks about the trauma of moral injury where you see horrific uh, events that are incongruent with what you think is morally correct and you have to process that. Um, one of my other colleagues, Dr. Patricia Newton, former president of the Association of Black Psychiatrists, did make a particular critique of Joy's work, which I think is important for you to understand. And she said it is more than a syndrome. It is, in fact, a disorder. And Dr. Newton points out that the disorder is a profound disruption of personality, normal brain structure, and functioning. And she concludes that the transatlantic slave trade system, the Middle Passage, um, resulted in the abnegation of traditional values with the grotesque values of mere survival, invading one's being and finding their way into the DNA of our continuous self-hate and self-destruction. In other words, it was and had become a disorder. She concludes that our children are therefore coping and adapting to destructive insanity, and we've become experts at dying. As a uh, spiritual force, then, of destabilization, she knows that this order, this disorder, etymologically refers to what she calls disordain. In other words, the word disorder means disordain, meaning to interrupt or negate the divine connection. And that speaks directly to ta Tahotep and Ma'at, which is the connection to the divine. And so um, our other colleague um, that um, I've given you that, well, no, let me go back. I read to you that this is Joy's description of the slave syndrome, but also she characterizes as vacant um, esteem, ever-present anger, and racist socialization. I'm not sure I gave you those three. Um, but the point is the violence, the terror continues. It's a Christmas time, Costco, where you could buy the juxtaposition. This was right after President Obama it was elected. The juxtaposition of a black baby was a monkey. The shoes that represent, these are the shoes that Nike pulled after a bunch of us protested, but they were to remind us of being enslaved and in shackles. And of course, so the, the imagery, the memetics of over and over again through the imagery forcing you, led uh, Wade Nobles, Dr. Nobles, to talk about shattered consciousness. And so as we continue to um, internalize these assaults, um, there is no difference between the shattered consciousness that occurred at the bottom of the boat and the shattered consciousness that we experience now. Monica Williams um, at the University of Louisville Center for Mental Health Disparity then said that uh, we're feeling constantly on guard, fears of being judged of the trauma, 
um, and leading uh, to depression. And symptoms specific to race-based trauma in African Americans may involve avoidance of white people, fears and anxiety in the presence of law enforcement, paranoia and suspicion, and excessive worries about safety of family and, and friends. Um, so we cannot underestimate um, these stressors, uh, nor get sidetracked by the individual racist acts of individuals when, in fact, <coughs> this is a systemic. Now, um, I assume that all of us gathered here would accept uh, Joy DeGreer's uh, basic assumptions um, about this post-traumatic slave syndrome, but I need you to understand that that is not true of everybody. And in fact, Ibram uh, Kendi, who's a professor of history and international relations and anti-racist research at American University, he is black, he says that her theory is in fact racist. Um, that black people uh, may have been physically scarred, but we were not mentally scarred. And in fact, that the fact that we had built institutions like that, like this, would show that we were not mentally scarred and that black people as a group do not need to be healed from racist trauma. But in fact, we just need to be um, healed, um, uh, freed from racist trauma. Um, it, when you look at his arguments, it appears from my perspective that it is indicative of false equivalence because he says that you know, we are the same as whites in that case. Um, but anyway, let me just go on and say that having said that then, and you have a sense of Dr. Joy's work. We can talk now about the implications that this new field that has emerged out of the Human Genome Project called epigenetics uh, raises a new kind of understanding as we think about the way in which genetic encoding impacts our conversation. Uh, because it's serving to reinscribe the issue of race uh, within a biological categories in a new kind of way. Um, Epigenetics uh, serves as an interface between our environmental experiences and how our DNA will be interpreted in response to those experiences. So it's, it's referred to kind of as a soft genetic, not a hard genetic. Um, but those groundbreaking studies have been done with populations such as SAFOTs, those who can force, uh, cast the future, Jewish Holocaust victims, uh, children who have been separated from their biological parents, uh, twins, um, communities who have a high degree of endogamy and genetic uh, isolation. Attention has been given to differences between the sexes and adolescent development cycles, and certainly epigenetics has been studied with veterans and children of mothers who have been impacted by attacks such as 911. Um, it has been done globally in terms of Dutch famine, um, in which there was an alteration of genes, in terms of the uh, Jewish Holocaust, in which there was a, uh, um, a gene uh, modification, revealed that children have a higher uh, disproportionate result in stress disorders, um, hypertension and obesity. Um, and so when we look at that, we have to accept the notion that racism is understood not merely as a system of discrimination for a particular generation, but also a curse that is passed through generations and affecting our health, like the DNA. And this helps us to understand and dig more deeply into the implications of Joy's work. Um, so Dr. Lubin um, talks about it being, and Dr. Lubin is a neuroscientist who, scientist who says, I believe it is six to seven generations, and she's assuming 25 years a generation, um, in which this DNA is encoded in terms of trauma. She said, we can learn from those who are resilient and attempt to mimic what is present because you can overcome these epigenetic traumas. Um, but there is a resilient population, and then there is a population that is susceptible. If we then were to look at David Williams' work, a Harvard epidemiologist, um, David uh, talks about the daily, everyday discrimination that we experience. You can look at those, you can read those, and you have probably all of them experienced in the last week. 
I mean, you just think about it. It happens all the time, over and over again. And then uh, Dr. Williams translates that into health outcomes. And so those hardened, seemingly intractable health outcomes of disparity between the well-being of black folks and, and white folks, um, Dr. Williams has suggested is related to our adaptation and accommodation of, of trauma through racism and epigenetics. Now, the book that is assigned for the class of Dr. Chisels will reaffirm all of what I am saying, and it is an extension of it, including his reference to uh, Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop. So I was glad to see that he even acknowledged Sheikh Anta Diop. And so what we can now and must conclude is that epigenetics uh, that challenged what many had concluded about race that was based on the Human Genome Project um, that is, it was hard, that race was inconsequential, that it was dead, it was irrelevant, it was finished, it was obsolete. To the contrary, race has once again, through the science of epigenetics, um, engendered a body of research and findings that concludes race and racialized categories to have meaning in new ways through the dynamics of epigenetics. And so it disrupts the dualism between the social and the biological. It disrupts this notion that race does not matter. And in fact, Troy Duster's view is that in this discipline of epigenetics, ranging from where you can go and you see its evidence being used now in forensic science all the way to pharmacology where they're developing drugs based on your genetic code, um, Goodness, when I was in the classroom in the 70s, I had a student after my class in racism come up to me at the last day and said he felt like a traitor. He was an officer in the Naval Academy and he brought me an article that talked about race-based weapons that were being developed by the Department of Defense in the 70s. So across disciplines, early childhood education, et cetera, et cetera, you can see the implications of epigenetics. And so this period of epigenetics in terms of soft genetics um, it is not so much race as a construct which is fixed um, a fluid or dynamic, uh, dependent on environment. But if you look at this in terms of eugenics, in other words, using genetic data for your purposes, um, you see that we have now reached another uh, level that challenges uh, the issue of ethics, bioethics, and what I call theoethics. And um, where we are now is to try and make sense out of this. And one of the things I would challenge us to do in this room is to see ourselves as interrupters in the process. Um, but to be interrupters, to be a radicalized, uh, to really take on this fight, we have to understand uh, what it is, in fact, and who it is we're fighting. Uh, Dr. Lubin that I mentioned is at the Department of Neurobiology and Neurosciences at the University of Alabama, in fact, um, in Birmingham. So we have uh, situated now Joy, Dr. Joy's uh, work um, in terms of this enduring legacy, and the operative word is enduring and continuous legacy. Um, and but there is one additional and significant area of inquiry that must be raised. I finished my PhD in 1972 at Northwestern. I was the first African American woman to get, a first African American, I guess, to get a PhD at Northwestern. And I was studying all this race. I was chairperson in my department. I could go on and on. I had a computer company. I was doing the internet before the internet. I knew what the Department of Defense was doing with the technology. I was uh, beta testing, sending signals up uh, to the satellite, track water, and having 30,000 children watch Bill Pinkney's soul circumnavigate the world. Born into South Africa, he's flying. He's sailing into South Africa, flying the red, black, and green flag, and the ANC is is sailing back out to meet him, flying the colors of the ANC. All of that. But <coughs> what I was struggling with is where are you God in this? And that is literally what sent me to seminary. And it's just that simple. I studied the Human Genome Project. I said, God got to be in this somewhere. So, and I said, already, you are kidding me. And so, having said that, then, um, the question, the question um, that I had to and have to raise is this question, if epigenetics has implication for us 
in terms of absorbing the trauma of the transatlantic slave trade system, then must it not have implications for those who would impose that kind of trauma on us? So if epigenetics underlies our trauma, does not epigenetics underlies the notion of white supremacy and white hegemonic systems that would suggest that they are supreme? Gail Christopher has reduced this in a polite way at the Kellogg Foundation around a notion of a global hierarchy of human value. The World Council of Churches has put out their Afrophobia as a global contract, uh, construct which suggests that white people in general, you or whites, are fearful of what Sheikh Anta Diop talked about in terms of the origins of world civilization. Are you following me? Yes, yes. So my question is, if epigenetics impact us, does epigenetics impact them? And if that is the case, then it seems to me that we need to think about what John Powell, my colleague in polite terms, calls implicit and explicit bias. We all operate with implicit and explicit bias. But I'm wondering if we ought to, uh, Dr. Aruba, start thinking about an Afrophobia identity delusion syndrome or Afrophobia identity uh, delusion disorder as we think about the ways in which we can be able to even get to a table towards reconciliation. White people need to, I mean, I love Dr. Blackman's capacity to address these issues, but he needs to be speaking to white people and the evangelical community. And he and those persons need to be really grappling, which, which some are, right? The ways in which they have not just benefited from the system in terms of reparations, but need to be healed from the system in terms of reparatory justice. And so I'm leaving that question on the table um, as I think about the implications of Dr. Joy's work for this conversation of where we go from here in terms of reparations to uh, reconciliation. And then that kind of, uh, I, I just want you to know that the, the epigenetics has shown that Afrophobia, white people's fear of us, that's, when, that's the kind, like when you get on an elevator black man and the white woman grabs her bag. You know what I'm saying? But we do that too, if the truth be told. Afrophobia is global. That's what a lot of this is about in terms of number 45, immigration. What's going on in Europe in terms of Islamophobia, right? Islamophobia, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to understand that there are visceral responses to us being black, walking around just being black. And that raises a different set of ethical questions. And so I'm saying that we have to look at racism as an ecosystem of paranoia, identity confusion. We have to look at it as grounded in Afrophobia and a belief in this hierarchy of human value. It is a disorder referring to a disturbance of function in terms of a syndrome noted to ways in which they respond to people of color. A language becomes important. And we've got to note that because otherwise we will uh, ourselves get caught up in naming and negating ourselves by virtue of what we think is true that is not true about us. And um, this is a question that black scientists have shied away from. This is a question me and, and Dr. Rubin have been having for years about the need for us to have black scientists at the table in a pluridisciplinary way to raise these very hard questions. We cannot get to reconciliation until we do that and to do that as a nation. Which then brings me to what Diop gave us. Diop gave us this two cradle theory. He said essentially that the uh, cradle of civilization was born in a southern cradle which had as its characteristics um, and a footnote here is let's be careful about this dichotomy between male and female. It is both and. And so I named that appositional unity. It is a male-female complementarity, not an either-or between male and female. 
is about collective and land ownership. It is about revering your elders. It is about burial. It is about monotheism, which we gave to the world. It is about the belief in the omnipotency of God. And we welcomed the stranger because we thought the stranger would go home. Because everybody wants to be at home, right? And it's about millennium of, situ uh, of civilization. We had civilizations for a thousand. The pyramids were built 4,000 years before the star shone over Bethlehem. You understand what I'm saying? Giaf says that's the southern cradle. That's Africa. Juxtapose that against a northern cradle, and you have tension between male and female. It's not complementarity. It's opposition. You therefore have marginalization of women. It was individual land ownership because they lived in a harsh climate. Aging became a disease. You cremated because you wanted to take your body and your loved ones with you. There was monotheism, there was a cold rain, and strangers remained an outsider because strangers came to take the little food you had because you were living in a harsh environment. And the Western civilizations, you're talking centuries, not millennia, right? So then I am saying that as we get to this moment of ethical uh, and theoethical uh, inquiry at this time of Afrophobia and epigenetics, then we need to understand the deep well of Ubuntu, the African construct that I am because you are, right? I am because you are versus a white supremacy hegemonic system, which is totally different. I don't have enough time to go through this, but this Ubuntu system has as its value system um, the concept of ma'at and the seven principles of ma'at, which I referred to um, on, the, on the first screen. That is truth, justice. If you want to know where the balance of the scales came from, it didn't come from Europe and Greece. It came from Egypt, Kemet, okay? Justice, righteousness, reciprocity, balance, order, and, and harmony. I just left South Africa, and the conversation there is around uh, reparations. But reparations as a part of the moment in historic time where we are now, where we have to look at what it is going to require to redistribute wealth. And the redistribution of wealth is going to come by different tax laws globally and nationally. And it's going to be grounded in what we know to be the consequential damage of climate control, which is going to cause all of this kind of Afrophobia globally to be an impact on us and our future as humans. Now, I, I'm, I'm used to it. I'm OK. 40 years, people have been saying you're crazy because you're raising these genetic questions. But let me just say this. And I said this in the article I published in the 70s. This. MIT, y'all know about MIT? Does that give you credibility? Technology review. You see that? We can now engineer the human race. Scientists are saying, stop us, y'all, because we know how to do it. Because we have broken the code and broken the code of the code in ways that put us in a position to do that. And the other thing that we should be mindful of is that China is leading a lot of the biotechnology in terms of the research that is now creating real threats of privatizing what it means to be human. There are declarations at the UN that we can appropriate if we can get the right people at the table to help inform some of us. Our organization is the United Nations non-governmental organization, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to end with raising the question of where do we go from here with a simple answer. We go to the issue of healing thyself. We have to heal thyself, and part of healing ourselves is to demand reparations and reparatory justice. Based on what we know about what our people have experienced, God would be offended if we did not speak up and say it was wrong. Yes and that we demand healing and reparations. Then we gotta be and do the healing work and the stewardship that allows us to do the external work to be agents of transformation. 
And that's what I mean by interrupters. We have to dare to go to those tables, from the White House to the NIH to wherever, to raise these kinds of questions. And then we have to go back to our communities and develop those one by one, one to one, healing spaces which will afford us an opportunity to heal the children yet to be born. So, let us think about this notion of an Afrophobia, identity, delusion, or disorder syndrome. Let us think about the fact that the President of Ghana has now invited us for the return, and we're taking a delegation, and we're going to be a part of the Pan-African Faith delegation that will engage in this healing work in Ghana as a part of the journey of remembrance, defying the door of no return. Let us go to New York and celebrate the Ark of Return, which is now the permanent memorial on the grounds of the United Nations, for which we began this conversation with a moment of silence. And then let us remember that we can come right home to Montgomery to let the healing continue. And last month, I was just there with 800 of my clergy as we walked those grounds and became renewed in our ministries to do the work that we all must do to be healed. Heal thyself, know thyself, and stay woke. Thank you. Dr. Carruthers. So, Dr. Charles, who was to give the response in the absence of Dr. Carter, um, he had to leave. But Dr. Carruthers was rolling around, rolling so nicely, you know, you can't interrupt interrupters when you're on that level of focus. So, he had to leave. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give a quasi-ethical response and to what Dr. a philosophical response to what Dr. Carruthers has posed, and then we'll continue with our, our question and answers. So if you want to know what I'm going to say, just listen, because I have no idea myself. <laughs> but let me begin with the, the first image that Dr. Carruthers posted, and that was the image of the, 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 the man with the scars on his back, the image of the, the, uh, the artwork, and I'm really hesitant to call it artwork, but that when you go into the National Museum, that's the first image that you see. And Dr. Warren and I, when we walked in, the first thought that hit me was Kanye West should be here. Because in many ways, he has become our representative philosopher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the things that he is saying are so awesomely terrifying. Yes. He said, this had to have been a choice. He said, how could you have gone through this for 400 years and not leave? When you look at those images, and, and they're so real and vibrant as you, as you enter into the, 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 the Museum of Justice, as you enter in, and it's a beautiful space. It's a very beautiful space, the contrast is how beautiful the space is and how horrific the pain is that we are, we are reviewing. And so you enter in and see this very horrifying image and it immediately impacts to what Brother Kirksey was saying and to what Dr. Gordon was saying. It immediately impacts us emotionally regardless of your race. It impacts us but in a different way. In the, in the, the Alexis de Tocqueville, who 
wrote this marvelous book called Democracy in America. He came over from Europe and he gave us the kind of like fresh impression of how we are supposed to see and understand what's going on in America. So he traveled around America and he took objective views of what was happening. And one of the things he said was that the descendants of slaves are motivated by a sense of shame. Because on every day, every day, I see, I see that in the contract that you just give, every single day we have to, uh, the descendants of slaves have to face the idea that my family, my progenitors, were owned by the other people. And within that, there's a sense of shame. And on the other side, for some, not all, there's a sense of guilt. So when you go into the national, into that uh, national museum, you see you have that sense of shame and guilt, and both of them producing various kinds of emotions, including anger. So what you will see often is that white visitors may be very quiet, subdued, <laughs> and sometimes crying. But interestingly enough, they are there. Now, one can raise questions about their motivation for being there. But they are in fact there. The the the, the black is black people visiting. You have to watch that too. And there is deep anger and deep hurt. And we witness um, that there's the part in the museum where they have where they collected the dirt from places where people were lynched and put them in these canisters, but it's also one where they have the dirt compacted upon each, on, on, like, on each uh, time that someone was, was uh, lynched. And for us to actually see that this dirt potentially has the DNA of family members. An extremely powerful motif that's run straight through and through this, this, um, this, this museum. But what's key, what keeps playing in my mind is the idea of someone saying it's choice. Now, several years ago, many of you may have seen the movie called, um, uh, what was the name of the movie? Uh, <laughs> a, young black, a, a young black guy played by C. Thomas Howell, along with a white guy played by C. Thomas Howell, he accepts uh, an, a, a scholarship to Harvard Law School as a white man, but he dies himself black. Oh. What was the name of the movie? He was saying? No. Yes, it was that. That's what he was saying. No. But anyway, James Earl Jones plays the professor. So while he was there as, as a black man, he goes, he having, he's not having black experiences. He's never had black experiences before as a white man. But not he's having true black experiences. And then when he's, when he's discovered at the end, he, he uh, whatever, he undies himself, but he's now white again. And he tells his professor, Rick, James, I mean, uh, James Earl Jones, he said, James Earl Jones says to him, he said, you know, now you know what it's like to be black. And he said, well, uh, no, sir. Um, I don't know what it's like to be black because if I didn't like it, I could leave. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a unique position to be a thing or any kind of thing. What it's like to be something or somewhat, someone is extremely unique. When it comes to race, there is no a priori blackness. That means there's no what it means to be blackness that's independent of experience, right? You don't, we, we, you weren't born as a baby in your mind black. There's no empire whiteness. There are constructs that comes upon us as we travel through. And those constructs, constructs then kind of add to how we see ourselves as human beings. And the adding of, based upon those experiences, given that there is no a priori independent basis for how one is to understand himself to be black or white, we have a uniqueness 
called cognitive closure. In other words, that my thoughts are private. The things I think are private. Your thoughts are private. I have no idea what you're thinking right now. Some of you are thinking some really grandiose and elegant things, like, wow, this presentation was off the charts. I think I can make a change. <laughs> Somebody else is thinking that Dr. Blackman presentation, that was beautiful. But as Dr. Quiller said, we really, really need to have a whole lot more of that conversation among them, because we need no real convincing. While at the same time, some of us were having, were thinking to ourselves, what time is lunch? <laughs> Longer do we have to go? Is the temperature, the temperature in the room fitting? Oh, she looks nice. Ah, he looks acceptable. You know, what mind is going to bring his friends? But cognitive closure means that no one can know what I am thinking. No one can know fully my experiences. I can understand your pain but I cannot know your pain. That's right. That's right. Now, that means that you ought to have a certain amount of openness. The, the, the term, Dr. Carruthers, reconciliation, is terrifying, it terrifying as well. I mentioned yesterday that when J.J. Roberts was, was pushing that notion of reconciliation back in 1972, that seemed very strange to me, because how can you have reconciliation if your, if, if your foot is still on my neck? Imagine raping somebody, and in the midst of the rape, say, well, do you forgive me? <laughs> well, I'll consider it after you stop the rape, but I cannot consider it right now. And uh, Malcolm said, this, said it this way, if, 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 you're, if you stick a knife in a man's back, eight inches and you put it up four inches, it's still in addition to another four inches. So we cannot have the conversation about reconciliation. We could put the groundwork for reconciliation in place so it could be a conversation. And some of that is a Peter Paris' book that we discussed yesterday with respect to forbearance and forgiveness and so on. But those kind of conversations are premature if in fact we are not talking about some level of reparations. Now I mentioned this notion of cognitive closure for a reason, and that is because the, you, the, the, the other cannot know, but the other should be willing to be empathic enough to seek to find out and have understanding. Because if you can have understanding, it gives you basis for a conversation. Remember the question that was asked yesterday uh, when, uh, when, when Peter Paris said, that to have common ground, there must be something there for conversation. There must be something there. So, the, so, so I pushed the first of the conversation about cognitive closure to show that I cannot know. And those of us who are in ministry or taught somewhere along the line, when somebody's family member dies and you go to talk to them, you do not say, I know how you feel. Right. Right. Amen. Because you don't. You may have a similar experience such that you can mm -hmm. understand how a human being can feel and respond in this way, but a person doesn't. As a matter of fact, for the descendant family members, I could understand because I have a dad, I have a granddad, right? I could understand, I have a mother, I have a grandmother. I could understand how it would feel, but I don't know. You are unique people with a unique set of cognitive closures. Yeah. Now, the, 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 the conversation with, with Dr. I know, with this, uh, and syndrome and versus disorder is an interesting one to me that Dr. Carter brought up because it is, disorder takes it to a further, to an extreme. And one of the things that Dr. Blackman was pointing out today is that how extreme the situation is, even further than we even thought, right? And quite frankly, it is even more extreme than that. Because you have so-called slavery, then you have this slavery by another name, and then you have mass incarceration, which is another type of slavery. And now in the present conversation, we're talking about another kind of slavery when we're talking about what trauma and ACEs have done to facilitate certain kinds of behaviors and responses in our young people such that they are tremendously obese, some of them, based upon trauma. 
So now, in their obesity or in their hypertension or their diabetes, they have limitations just like cells. Yes. Once again, enslaved in their own bodies. And the way in which we respond and the way in which we have a conversation with them is extremely difficult because of cognitive closure. Several years ago, Victor Anderson from Vanderbilt University wrote a wonderful book called Ontological Blackness. And he says, ontological blackness is the black youth blackness that white people created. Let me let that sit for a second. <laughs> ontological blackness is the blackness that whites created. Now, I understand I used the word ontology yesterday, and so the word ontology speaks to what it means to say that I exist or anything exists. Ontological blackness, that means the present state of blackness was created and manipulated, as Dr. Coons, you mentioned, she talked about the lenses yesterday, a certain set of lenses, and I like the, 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 the notion of af, um, afrophobia, a certain set of lenses have been given to white interpretation of blackness. And the scary part of the danger is that black people have taken and reassessed, and as, some of us have assigned the same kind of blackness, same kind of views of our blackness. Because in, in the, they, they did a study several years ago, that, that thoroughfare called the New Jersey Turnpike, my brother, my little brother, was he had dreadlocks down to his back of his leg. Very handsome guy, I don't like him. Now, my, my brother was pulled over, going from Baltimore to New York City, he was pulled over at I-95 on the New Jersey Turnpike six times. Brother Kirk said, six times. He got to the point where he said, to, he got to the, the fourth pullover and they said, can we search your car? He said, why don't you call your buddies down the street and ask them what they found last time they searched my car? Right? But here's the scary part. The officers weren't all right. So, so part of the danger is, is that those who you would think would have a similar kind of cognitive closure, that is a similar kind of understanding of what it means to be black, and blackness and black consciousness don't get it at all. Yeah. And so therefore, we have to now redefine our conversation not in terms of racism based upon pigmentation, but racism based upon identification. You know, you you, can, you identify. So you identify with the system. So police brutality. In terms of racial police brutality, it's not just about white officers being black or black people, because with Freddie Gray, guess what? There's some black officers there, but they're, re they're representing a system that is white supremacist ideology. Therefore, they're just as white in the ideological perspective as the persons who they are representing. So, cognitive closure on one hand, we need to understand that though we have uniqueness, on the inside, everyone doesn't look like us, even though pigmentation-wise they do. There are those who do not understand and don't get it. Now, I say a couple more things and then I will close. Um, in our conversation at the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare, which I messed up that name yesterday, but I got it right today, so that I should have a highlight right there. In our conversation, <laughs> thank you. In our conversation, we are engaged in many, many, many different parts. It is absolutely amazing and astounding that a tragedy, and a, a, um, an intentional tragedy, is birthing so much reach worldwide. The, your, your, your fathers and your mothers and your cousins and your, and your family members who went through the syphilis study, the United States some public health service civil study at Tuskegee, their, their, their sacrifice has created a groundswell such that we are reaching to parts of the world in the work that we're doing. Dr. Warren and I were at, were at, were at the UAB um, on December 18th in a conversation about clinical trials of xenotransplantation. They invited us to come because um, this is Tuskegee University. And it is the moral epicenter at bioethics and public health ethics. Make no mistake about it. This is the moral center. So a lot of questions come for us to participate in conversations. And we have to be 
very meticulous and ethical and wise about which conversation we choose to engage and which one we have to put a hold on. The Zeno transplantation was one such debate or conversation. Zeno transplantation, the word Zeno means strange, different, or foreign, and transplantation, you know what transplantation is. So it means to take a foreign or a strange body organ and put it in that into a human. So uh, uh, taking a pig's kidney and put it into a human. Take in a pig's heart and put it into human. Now, we must admit that the technology has gone has, and the medicine has moved rapidly and is about well five years away from, or less than that, from doing these kind of massive, massive um, uh, transplantations. But as a people, what does that mean for us? Should we be concerned? Well, some of you may say, well, <laughs> Well, well, Dr. Hagen, if I'm, if I'm sick and you give me a pig kidney, give me that kidney. And I don't mind. How long that kidney gonna last? Well, a pig, the life expectancy for a pig is between five to seven years. So when I don't give me five to seven years, give me that kidney. And then, that, so Dr. Warren's question is, wait a minute now. What happens when that kidney expires? Well, we can give it out to kidney because we're gonna be engineering pigs for that purpose. And my question as an ethicist, an animal rights ethicist, I'll raise a question. Well, aren't you going to ask the pig for permission <laughs> for his kidney? No, I'm going to ask me this even for that purpose. So then the, the next set of questions, according, based upon our clinical trials research, is when are you going to instruct them about this kidney? Well, at the end of life. That is bastard. That is unethical. In other words, if you wait to, to instruct people at the end of life that you only have this one option, then what is that what most people are going to say? Give me that option. Well, the work that we do, and this is why we have to tell UAB to hold off. They held off for years, right? We have to tell them to hold off because we have to let them know, first of all, we're not coming to you unless we are sure and have confidence in your trustworthiness. Yes. Yes. We trusting, ladies and gentlemen, is as natural as breathing. You trust in the air that you're breathing that is not filled with cyanide right now, right? Trusting is natural. Trustworthiness is moral. We do not know that you're trustworthy. We do not know that you're moral. So the, 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 the onus of trustworthiness is based upon the person who wants to have the interaction. We need to make sure we can trust you. That is, so we're sitting at the table and, and I, I, I got a, lot, a little heated because the director kept loud talking me. And I'm really, I'm going to sound loud now because of the preacher thing, but we never saw spoken. I'm a very quiet guy. <laughs> but I didn't like him who was loud speaking. And so I said, you know, you're blatantly dishonest. And he stepped back for a moment. And at that point, he started to segue. And I said to myself, here it is. This is what it's all about. Being at the table where we can make ethical and moral, helpful decisions and defenses for those of our people who need it. Now, that's not to make the medical decisions for you, but just to let you know what the options are and what the ethics of the options are so that you can make helpful decisions for yourself and your family. Mm -hmm. That's just one. You just engage in a conversation right now with, with Case Western University, and that conversation is about human fusion. I'm listening to this thing that's blowing my mind because years ago, way years ago, there was a thing called um, the bionic man, remember? Yeah. The bionic woman. That stuff is real now, except that is human fusion, the, the technology of the hand movements are fused with, the, with your mind, and you can act as like having a real arm, a real hand. But there's some other interesting parts. What if someone taps into your hand technology, and you see your hand doing things that you didn't tell it to do? <laughs> or, you know, or, or your, 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 or your legs, you're running in a direction you didn't want to run. You got to stop, hold it breaks. Ask the question. I love what you just said. The technology is there to do some weird stuff, and medical is, medicine is there to do some stuff. But at what point do we raise the ethical questions about these things? In closing, the young man said, 
I do not know, but I understand. I do not know, but I understand. No one could know everything about what it means to be black, what it means to be white, what it means to be a mother who has lost a son or a father who has lost a daughter. No one could understand, could know that. But through empathy, we can understand. We are uniquely placed and positions as human beings. Paul Tillich um, wrote, a, wrote out an idea several years ago. Paul Tillich was one of America's great theologians, and he defends the belief that God is our ultimate concern, and that God is the ground of all of our being. The interesting part of that is how he constructs humans. He says that human beings are embedded in God. That is our essence, though we live in existence. So though you can see me and I can see you and we can see each other, that's an existential state. But there is an essential state that we all have groundings. And another way to talk about that essential state is to talk about the values and morality that governs our existence. Some people located in God. Some people are located in reason. Some people are located in emotions. But we got, I'm sorry, people located in consequences. But regardless of where you locate, what your existential life, that is your physical life is going to do, it should be grounded in something greater than yourself. All right, so now we, this is the end of my session. Let's take a couple of minutes to formulate some questions, and uh, Dr. Carruthers and I will move to the table, and we'll be happy to respond and address those questions. Thank you very much. So 
there's always a question of ethics as far as pharmaceutical companies, so I kind of just wanted your thoughts on that. Very good, thank you. No, I understand. I have two responses. Um, the, let me take my second response first, and that is, ladies and gentlemen, there are 30,000 trans grants annually, but there are 120,000 people annually needing transplants. So even if we did get the 30, thousand kidneys this year. Next year we need to have another thirty thousand kidneys plus we're gonna still be at a hundred and ten to hundred and twenty thousand people. Now sixty five to seventy five thousand of those people look like the majority of us in this room. And on a sidebar Many of us have justification for why we're not organ donors. It's kind of hard to trust a system, like I mentioned earlier with respect to trust and trustworthiness, that has been consistently antagonistic to a basic sense of humanity. Very difficult to trust that system. But we have a very real life situation. So that tells us you have 65,000 kidneys that um, that's going to mean, let's say it, let's say it costs $100,000 to do a kidney transplant. This is going to be an extremely lucrative, lucrative endeavor, plus all of the pharmaceutical needs that come after to prevent rejection. Right? This is going to be a, a massively um, uh, financial blessing to proponents of this kind of thing. So not just I'm doing this in terms of your health care, but it's also there's a financial benefit for us to get black people, but all people, but taking black people to comply. Add to that, this is now leads to the first part, where that immediately comes to mind. It adds to that in the research that we've done, it shows that there's a there's a that black people are um, have low participation in clinical trials. And for other kinds of reasons, many kinds of reasons, but the research is not done yet. We still have a lot more work to do on why uh, black people are putting the brakes on on, um, on on clinical trials. But it is in that investigation, Zara, it is in that investigation we are able to discover and to then educate the populace of what their true needs are. So then, the more we do the education, uh, uh, Aristotle would call it the moral education towards habituation of particular sets of behaviors, the more we did those, then we would be uh, more complicit with good than with bad. Because we're actually taking a forward step, a positive act towards being helpful. Um, so we cannot, we, can, we cannot, uh, we cannot take off take our, our minds off the fact that there's a whole lot of money to be made in this industry, a whole lot of money is being made in this industry, and we are not, we're kind of stepping away rather than holding the pharmaceutical companies accountable for what they are, for what they're doing and how they're producing. Um, just before I came into speak, I took a look at the pharmaceutical companies to see how much money they're making. I was absolutely stunned, not only by the level of billions of dollars that they're making, and that is the top two money makers I've never heard of before in my life. So like, where are this thing coming from? We need to do more in pushing the conversation and asking the questions like you're asking to make sure that we can do, that we can be beneficial to the people who we serve. I have two responses. One is, um, <clears throat> we need to, do a cost-benefit analysis in terms of where we spend our time and energy as well. And there's some things I think Dr. Chisel says in the book about optimum health that means that we have to take control over our own diets and our own behaviors that would mitigate against us needing a kidney transplant for the first part. And diabetes and all of these diseases that we have. And, and I certainly can speak to kidney disease because my father made medical history as one who was uh, one of the first transplants. He could not even have 
pain medication when he came out of uh, the surgery, 18 hours of surgery at the VA hospital in Denver. And what was very interesting to me was I was there as a daughter who wanted him to live, obviously, but we knew that 90% of the patients who went down to surgery would not come back alive. The other thing that was the very month that JAMA magazine had as its cover, aging is a disease. And I had to juxtapose, as a sociologist, a Western culture that considers aging a disease versus a Western culture that has in its hands the power to do that kind of medical transplantation. And so I was in a, a situation of conflict, quite frankly. But fast forward, the pharmaceutical companies have privatized, again, the creation of God. And so now you have native populations, indigenous populations, who have in their environments all of the things the pharmaceutical companies are going and extracting both their knowledge and their resources in order to sell it back to them and hold hostage. And so I think, as my grandmother said, it's important for us not to have the answers to the wrong questions than to have the right answers to, the, to have the right answers to the wrong questions and not have answers to the right questions. And so I'm saying that the right question may be not about so much how we participate in the game, but how we interrupt the game. Um, on that, kind of going off of that a little bit, uh, my name is Dara Blackwater, I'm from the Diné Anama tribe in New Mexico, and um, my question is uh, more on the multi-generational trauma that you were speaking to first, and with Native Americans, at least in my, uh, what I've seen growing up here at the reservation, uh, a kind of strange thing has happened, which is that the government has kind of, they're not, they don't necessarily have to try to kill us anymore because we're doing it ourselves. Um, the suicide rates on the reservation, the alcoholism, the domestic violence, we're doing it to ourselves and we're doing it to each other. And it seems like that is um, coming from a place, when I talk to my uh, father or grandfather or whoever about, um, about healing and about some of the things that we're talking about to them, that's like woo-woo out there, like doesn't, doesn't register to them because they're so deep in denial that they don't even understand that these things are happening to them and, and that it's been happening all their lives because they don't know anything different. So I guess I'm wondering um, from a perspective of somebody who is immersed in this environment and understands and believes um, and knows that all of that is heavy on them even though they can't see it, where do you start with that? And it sounds like you've been ahead of your time, um, so I, it's, I'm sure you have a lot of experience having to explain things to people that they think you're absolutely nuts um, talking about. And so I'm just wondering where do you start and how you approach, while also while also acknowledging that denial is is a stage of grief and that it's okay to be there, but also encouraging them to get past that stage. <laughs> Um, my experience is that the elders probably do know. And part of what you have to bring to them, I think, is a presence of trustworthiness that allows them to open up and share. Well, we just uh, sponsored um, a truth-telling commission for Elaine, Arkansas where the 1919 Elaine Massacre was held. It was the worst massacre of black people in a church known in this country. Um, over land theft and cotton theft, labor theft, et cetera, et cetera. The takeaway in the documentary we're going to do is called Hush Mouth. Hush Mouth was the punishment and the word, and we talked about that a little bit yesterday. You're not to talk about it. And so the elders, you know, silence makes a mighty noise. And so it is denial, but it's something else, as you've alluded to. It's also the processing of the pain and the trauma. 
So I think what we have to do is be more attentive to creating environments where our elders can be free to talk and to tell us what they know and to make it clear that we will take their knowledge and do with it what we need to do with it to win. And if we fail, we will try to win and fail trying. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the elders aren't going to talk to us because they don't trust us with the wisdom that they have. And I am fairly confident, based on what I know about our people, <laughs> as I told you, I was an honorary animal, but the elders don't. We gotta figure out how to get them to tell us what they know. Because it is intentional genocide. And that's the continuing trauma that has affected and Alexis de Tocqueville talked about that as well. In The Three Races of Mankind, chapter 18, which is not in most editions. The Three Races of Mankind, he predicted the genocide of Native people. And black people always attempting to insinuate themselves among white culture as the future of the Three Races of Mankind. Thank you for that question. Thank you for that response. The I'm, I am diabetic. My mom is diabetic. Uh, there's 12 of us. I'm number 11 of the 12, and most of them, my siblings, are diabetics. I have an endocrinologist in, at Cleveland Clinic in uh, Western Florida. And each time we go, we have wonderful conversations. I think he, he, we had we have such, such fun talking. We ended up staying over an hour. I'm concerned with the people waiting, but he enjoys talking. <laughs> he told me something. Uh, Ms. Blackboard about the, he said that we're trying to do so much work, work in South Florida, in Hollywood, Florida, you have that Seminole, um, Seminole is also Seminole County, but that is where, that's where the Seminole Reservation is. So Hard Rock Cafe um, and Hard Rock Casino are built on there. And that, you, you step in there, they can step into Las Vegas the money generated is as absolutely huge. So therefore, the, 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 the members of the tribe receive a certain amount of money from this. So the resources are there. He said to me, he said we, we, he said we try to provide, diabetes is rampant in that community. He said we try to provide resources and help and di, um, nutritional classes and, uh, support groups in that community. And he said, we even, Hard Rock Cafe even gives us room and space to have those conversations. We go, all we go to their homes, but they're resistant. They're not allowing us in. And he said, he said, he said, do you have any advice for how we're going to reach these people who have the need and we have the response? And that I went back to our conversation. I said, they don't trust you. And they have no basis for trusting you. Just because the train of tears which began there was so, so many years ago, that doesn't mean the memory and institutional memory has ended. There's no basis for trust. So therefore, you have to show yourself trustworthy by beginning with a conversation. Because I think um, the word I would use consistent with what Dr. Corinthians is saying is in terms of, of, of the, the, with our elders, and which we did last year with the Public Ethics Forum at the CDC, to engage the elders, to give us, to let us talk to us, because we had an amazing conversation. That mean, I was looking, I was kind of chuckling. Dr. Warren was defending the belief that he's not old. <laughs> and one of the personnel on the team was saying, you are old. And she said, no, I am not old. I'm an, uh, to use Dr. Who was here last year? Dr. Oh, dear sister from the Virgin Islands, my sister, Georges. Georges. She said last year, she said, I am an emerging elder. She said, it's happening. Because that's, at that point, you know, Donald Trump is a president, he's a president, he's an old, he's in the 70s, he's an old man. So all people need to know their places. 
But what we're actually seeing happening is that our elders have great participation, great intellectual gifts and powers and education that we are not availing themselves, ourselves to receive. So part of our moral education in this regard, and I, I completely agree, that we need to engage the elders. And begin, it begins by really shutting up and allowing them to speak, be quiet, and allowing them to share. And it's not going to immediately share, but if you're quiet long enough, we will hear their voices. Can I share something? What? Oh. oh, sorry. Oh, it's a sharing here. We get you to share. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. You can go okay, okay. Right, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Cindy Ezekiel. I'm from a Harry Lincoln College, and I'm a medicine resident there. Uh, this question really is um, I wanted to just ask our brothers if, she could ex if you could actually expand on the statement she made earlier connecting reparations uh, with um, climate change and the, the, the necessity to link the two. I heard you say, I heard you speak on it, but I don't think I caught everything that you were saying in an expanded form. I just want to hear more of your thoughts on that. Okay. <clears throat> so globally and even in this country, issues of demographic shifts are being driven in large part by climate change, the way people are responding to the need to have healthy communities, to have access to life-giving resources. And so much of the consequence of the climate abuse that is being uh, triggered by decisions humankind is making and those in power particularly are making, including decisions we're hearing about in the last 48 hours in terms of this country's policies, are going to continue to create the kind of, of movement of people and lack of access to opportunities to have uh, fresh food, to be able to control their economies, et cetera, et cetera. You take a country like Guyana, where <coughs> the abuse of the combination of the abuse that they are receiving now as a result of climate um, injustice and self-interest in terms of profit taking, they're extracting all of the minerals out of the country which are now then projected to deplete the natural resources of a nation within the next 10 years. If you look on paper, it looks like their GNP is rising, but in fact, if you were to factor in the depletion that's going on, in 10 years, they're going to be on the negative side. Are you following me? I, I am actually. That kind of extraction analysis juxtaposed against the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few so that the gap is getting larger and larger and larger, the only way to address that is within the context of national and global tax laws, which will mitigate against international companies going and playing the game of going and setting up corporations where they don't have to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. And for persons like 45 giving benefits to those who are the wealthiest in this country so that the school teachers don't pay more taxes than the president of Amazon, mm -hmm. right? And so you combine the issue of climate injustice with the issue of tax injustice and the equation can only lead to reparatory justice and reparations, i.e. the redistribution of wealth. And that has to be a decision that is demanded and is argued for and we figure out how to do it because there's not enough way, there are not enough bootstraps for you to pull up on and there are not enough boats for you to be rising on. Mm -hmm. Unless there is intentional effort to interrupt the system as the system is formally and officially operating right now. And so the combination of climate justice, tax justice, and reparations. And as we were talking about this as a small group, it occurred to me that this is really the Zacchaeus' story in the body in terms of the transformation of a system by the transformation of he as a tax collector. Because the end of that was reparations. He gave back and multiplied what he gave back to the people that he had exploited. 
What I was going to ask Dr. Blackman was, had he put the econometric analysis and created, or is there a way in which he can share his data so that that can be done as a part of building the national and global argument for reparations? The unpaid labor. I mean, Martin Luther King talked about the fact that you can never pay us for what you did to us, but you could account for the amount of unpaid labor. But they want you to only believe he said, I have a dream. <laughs> Martin Luther King talked about reparations. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Cruz? Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to share a reflection in response to Ms. Blackwater and a question for Dr. Perlers and Dr. Koch, uh, especially with the, the mantra of know thyself, know thyself. So I'm in a dual elder position in the sense that I am now 70 but my mother is 97 going on 98. She is truly, we are in an intergenerational dysfunctional pattern of family life, where a lot of history of what happened in the Filipino-American War and World War II, with Japanese occupation under American colonial governance of the Philippines and her internalization of oppression and her own personal traumas, shared traumas in the family, I think put her in a shut down mode. I can say honestly that I'm only now discovering that I could not access what she knows because I was so full of fury and anger and criticism of your internal oppression, your whiteness, your acceptance of white European paradigm of medicine, your uncritical acceptance of the American occupation of the Philippines, your on and on and on and on. And I think it's only in recent years that my heart has softened. And with a softness that she can hear and feel, she's able to tell me more. Mm -hmm. And she can say things like, I did not know this or this or this or nobody taught me how to be a mother. Or I had no mother. Or the American soldier killed my fiance because he thought he was Japanese. Or that when your father was killed in front of us, I wanted to die. I didn't want to have children anymore. But you were there, and I had to continue living. But I can honestly say, Miss Blackwater, that she could not tell me that because I was so full of anger. Come on. And my question to you is to be woke was all I could do. And I think I survived by projecting all my anger in activist work where I was in battle with the enemy. I could survive. And I could survive by working 110% time in three different jobs all at once and just surpass everybody else in all these elite institutions. And now I am in, uh, I'm trying to shed off all that trappings. That's part of the reason why I don't like to say what degrees I have or anything like that. Right. But 
I guess I'm appealing to you, both of you who have been trained in things of God. I do not know how to go any further with softening my heart or maturing in the soul because I have survived by living with an analytical mind, with a sharp tongue, and a critical pose. And I think unless I can get past that, I cannot truly interrupt that cycle for my children and grandchildren because I hold that anger and I hear Dr. Blackman talk about what happened with slavery by another name, and I cannot help but feel like I gotta go back to the ramparts and know how to fight. <laughs> and not knowing how to fight is irresponsible. I really don't know how to deal with a tension between the survival of now and knowing how to fight and being martial and soldierly in constitution on the one hand and on the other hand knowing that all will be lost and part of my family will be destroyed if I cannot get past my own trauma yes. behaviors. Yes. 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 There are a couple of comments I'd like to make. I'm 74, and I lost my mother uh, a year and a half ago at age 99. And I am truly blessed. I have been able, unlike your story, I think, um, been able to manage the anger in a way that is deeply grounded in both my faith and my understanding of the African meaning that is grounded in the comedic philosophical system that says we are building for eternity. Once you begin to think about building for eternity, as opposed to building for tomorrow. It makes and brings purpose and meaning to your work. Where, and this is what I have done, is I've attempted to invest in planting seeds in the next generation's possibilities. In the black church, we call it eschatology, where you can claim the not yet in the already. That's what the slaves were able to envision for us to be sitting here. What we unfortunately too often do, I think, is to be guilty of amnesia and forgetfulness in ways that dishonors their sacrifices. But we cannot do this work of justice and activism expecting to see the change in our lifetime. It's not going to happen. And so the tension between the expectation of wanting it to happen yesterday and being comfortable with it probably is not going to happen is the space in which a lot of anger and frustration occurs. And what I am finding at the tables, the diverse tables that I sit at, is sometimes a table between the Black Lives Matter generation and the Black Power generation is that gap to which there is a different expectation of what can happen when. <clears throat> and we've got to figure out how to create what I call not intergenerational, but transgenerational tables where everybody can come with a spirit of freedom to share <clears throat> and to learn and to build for eternity. Because it puts you on a different trajectory of what you do and how you do it. My mother is 87 years old. I'm 53. I know I don't look good. I have some features. <laughs> <laughs> but I 
that's my mother. I said, Mama, you be praying for me? And she said, Why? <laughs> Why? We pray for you since you have a baby. I said, You ever miss a day? She said, No. Yes, that's one. Yeah, you are Yeah, yes. <laughs> and so there's a song. It goes like this. I'm not going to sing because if I did, it would stop the whole conversation. <laughs> My mother loves me, she loves me. She gets down on her knees and hugs me. She hugs me like a rock. She loves me like the rock of ages. I almost was to say. Like the rock of ages. My mother, I, I misbehaved, Dr. Miskunas. I misbehaved um, because, like I said, there's a lot of us. I'm the, I'm the baby, my little brother, the one I don't like. He is the baby. I'm the, baby. I'm the one who wears the coat of many colors because of my mother. But one of my brothers said something to me he shouldn't have said. I cursed him out. I, I asked God to give me some more words to curse him just for I was cursed him. I, I, was, I was thinking of filthy words to tell him. I was hopping, I was cursing him so bad. And I don't know I really felt bad. I invented some terms, and I felt like, oh, that's a problem. And the next day I was driving to school to work for a little boy in Crowley. And my mother called me and she said, where are you? I said, I'm on my way to work, mama. I said, did you pay for me? She said, yes, 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 but where are you now? I said, I'm on the highway. She said, pull over. I said, pull over? I'm trying to get to work. She said, pull over. I said, well, okay, mama. And I pulled over. I my mother said, I, I understand, Stan, I heard that you cussed your brother out yesterday. I said, yes, I did, I cussed him out my seat. And my mother said, I you feel proud of yourself. I said, yes, very proud, but I invented a new vocabulary. And my mother said to me, she, uh, school, she said, I am so disappointed in you. I said, well, wait a minute now. <laughs> but I cussed him good. <laughs> She said, yes, I'm sure you did. But you're supposed to be the family priest. You're supposed to be the family pastor. You don't have permission to act like your father's children. Because I'm my mother's child, and the rest of them are my father's children. <laughs> you don't have permission to act like them. There's a great expectation for you. So, so as we were speaking, I mean, I was tearing up myself because I think of the tremendous input. I, I got word that she's having a little health difficulty. And uh, Dr. Warren said, do what you got to do. I was, I was almost not here <laughs> until I got con confirmation and conclusion that she was going to be okay because that's my mama. And the worst thing I could have heard from my mother because I stood on the highway. I didn't make it to class that day for the curtsy. I cried. I bawled like a baby. But my mother said, she's disappointed. But my point is that years ago, after I got married from Malcolm X, I was like most of us. I just went around trying to cuss all white people. You devils, you know, when you read that book, you get really, really angry. You devils, you need permission to cuss white people. And my mother told me back then, she said, it is not that easy. You can't just go around cussing all white people. You have to find a way to forgive. Yes. Not the reconciliation thing that requires the reparation, but forgive as for you so that you will be free, free enough yes. to make the journey. Yes. Because if all you have is bitterness and hatred and condemnation, it eliminates conversation of potential of evil. So, that's what my mama, that's not good. That's what my mama. So, so, so Dr. Moore and I have a lot of conversation about Mama because I speak more about Mama than I speak about James Cone, Paul Tillich, Tip Ryan O'Neill, because that's the first and greatest theologian that I've ever heard. I think uh, we are at, really at our end because we have to, we have to uh, transition, we have to go to lunch and come back. So thank you very much for this conversation. Before you leave, hold up now. Dr. Warren, is it now Dr. Warren's hand to give us a gift?